Today, we are going to go right into our feature program, which I am very excited about, that we have here with us Bill Thibodeau, Chris Payhood, and Jack McCarthy. The first one, this is kind of a quick one. Uh, it's basically based on alliteration and ass ass assassination, and uh, I just, it's just a fun thing I wrote. Uh, it's called Alliteration Oz. What price poets pay to please through heavy haunted hearts that bleed? They sacrifice sad souls to tease to a world that waits and wants and needs. The finest fools seek forever flames whose pleasures promise pangs of pain. A cool caress only nearly tames what will roar and rise and rage again. Ah, uh, the world's shan't say I did not strive to proudly pierce her precious heart. When high you shoot, someone must sigh. Yes, this I've sensed from the very start. Oh, what's the use in saying things those captivated ears can't hear? For songs this soul sings turn fate echoings, which will bring her never, never near. Alliteration eyes. The, uh, this, First one, the next one is, uh, I belong to the Carpenter Poets of Jamaica Plain, and periodically we have a reading, and uh, you have to write poems based on carpentry and, and the like. And uh, we've done that for the last three or four years, and we've got a lot of success. I, uh, I wrote this one, but not all of them are, you know, like any work you do, it's not always happy. Uh, I, I wrote this one based on Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground. It's called Notes from an Underground Carpenter. <clears throat> Early mornings stagger into late evenings, consuming entire weekends when things don't go according to plan, which is often. The weather plays with me. The phone rings, someone can't make it in. The phone rings, your order will be delayed. The silent chaos that lurks behind an innocent looking wall or ceiling or floor. But you have to look, you can't not look. You've got to tear it out and play it out carry to the extreme that which would pass with half the effort. Installing an Eden kitchen, the center of their home, their universe, they are not so subtle reminders of the inconvenience, the expectation, but often that's the nature of the game. Create order out of chaos without true reward, sacred out of profane without false faith. I shouldn't let it bother me so, yet strangely, I think to myself how fortunate that I live alone, that I don't hear complaints and demands when I come home. Why am I always late, always away, always distant? I've spent so much time working on the houses of others that I neglected to build a home of my own. That circle may never be complete. That moon shades shy of full and on the wane. And the last thing I want to see when I get home is another project. I think of this now over breakfast in my basement apartment as the silence is punctuated by heels on the brick sidewalk, passers-by like the rush of a river flowing to some mystical sea, their inconvenience, their expectation. Blessed as I am with the wealth of few wants, how fortunate I am. Yet the foundation of my freedom cracks and the cold, damp mist of reality seeps in. Ever a renter, never an owner still internally hopeful for an external ideal. While I witness the graying shift to my youthful calculus, a man born free but everywhere chains, a slave to my own standard. What I'm going to be, I already am. How could it be otherwise? A man has to do something, be good for something, at something, accepting his role in the cultural drama, the social contract, aligning himself with the forces of imperative, yet aware that it comes with a price. But as the day slips not so quietly into night, the precision and purpose of the work narrows my focus to a laser-like point. No distractions but the draftsman's visions, abstractions into hard angles. No dreams but the dance of hands over wood, the dust of creation in the air. No sound but the drone of hammers and saws, punctuated by the passing of heels on the pavement. Notes from underground. <clears throat> uh, 
I live by the Animal Rescue League in Boston, and uh, every so often somebody walks in and brings their dog in, and they usually don't come out. Uh, this one I happen to witness. Uh, it's called Duet. Those of you who have pets, you know, it's a long uh, relationship, but it, it ends eventually. Duet. An old man, an even older dog, struggle together along the sidewalk, leading to the Animal Rescue League. The old man with low shuffling gait over the uneven bricks. The dog in staccato steps forces his legs to remember their four-legged rhythm. They arrive at a tree outside the entrance marked animal intake. It extends its gnarly bark trunk through a sterile patch of dirt ringed with granite cobblestones. The dog meekly pulls the old man in automatic toe to the tree. He rears his backside over the dirt, dutifully arranges himself in strained contortions so that his movement doesn't soil the sidewalk. Then the one looks up as the other down, and they meet in gray glistening eyes, their mouths formed in the tender smiles of singers of a plaintive song, a deep knowing that this living ritual this engagement is coming to a close. The dog completes his forced movement, struggles to regain composure, and the two timidly walk to the awaiting door as a chorus of humming flies assembles around the base of the tree. A duet. Failed poem. Uh, this next one is called Failed Poem. Uh, Sometimes you have something that's so nice next to you that you really couldn't write it. What you write doesn't do it justice. It's called Failed Poem. You are lying too near for me to think. You sleep while I dream in waves. My left arm holds your body far too close for me to compose. The world is here, but the words won't come. Your vital heat warms my life-chilled blood. Your rhythmic beating rise and fall breathing, your scent envelops the all of me. And those fleeting images, fluttering symbols, sparring with the candle flame, can never hope to contrive or condense this scene into verse. Rogue words that do find their halting way to the pen in my right hand suffer their profane mission. This failed attempt is my gift to you. Yes. <clears throat> this next one is a uh, sort of like a, it's called Ken. It's uh, about a family tree. It's maybe the end of a line. And the, my line, I don't have any children, so uh, I, I just look at the, my particular twig of that as the end. Ken. I saw the end of my line incised on a bark bear branch, a secret I couldn't keep from myself. <laughs> the knowledge of a storm flash strike, a corkscrew cleft on a leaf, on a limb now leaf bereft. No canopy to obscure a fledgling nest from the hawk, the crow, the warm summer rain. No nourishing gift to drop as fertile mast from this outstretched, withering winter gray arm. No seed by seed release from fingertip tendrils to forest furrows to the moss rimmed dish of the swollen doe. This limb soon to break under its own weight, to snap at its rotten knot through a communion of laws, weakened by the drilling of sightless worms, the press of ice and snow, and the indifferent kiss of the wind, to fall and to affect a muted rising in the tinder kindled smoldering of an earthen hearth, in sympathy with its host through, low, through slow, lonesome decay. So, Kim. Uh, this next one is uh, my little war or anti-war poem. It's uh, I've written in a woman's voice. Uh, not everybody comes back from the war dead, obviously, uh, but some of them come back not quite the person they used to be, mental, uh, some kind of emotional or physical trauma. It's, it's untitled. <clears throat> it's in the woman's voice and her husband's coming home. His plane is circling, set to land. His plane now taxis to the gate. His plane now empties. He is last. A chair rolls towards me with my mate. At first, I see no change at all. At first, I see the man I wed. At first, I see him brave and tall, the only man to share my bed. 
A velvet rope I stand behind. A velvet rope that seems a chain. A velvet rope is all there is between me and a smile of pain. The cameras flash, I shade my eyes. The cameras flash, he shields his face. The cameras flash, have they no shame? Another war, another place. My eyes close to our wedding dance. My eyes close to his safe return. My eyes close to my closing eyes, to the road where his legs burn. Uh, this next one is um, uh, dedicated to my friend Elizabeth. Uh, she told me a, an idea she had from a poem once, and I said, oh, that sounds nice, and I went off and wrote it myself. <laughs> I don't know if she's in here now, but... Uh, <laughs> it's a different poem, but it's the same subject. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm the only one that's ever done that. <laughs> called Rain Falls on a Morning Rush. It's a young couple, uh, just a little background. In Boston, there's a uh, park plaza that has swans on the top. Have you ever seen that big wooden swans? And uh, my, mine's, my young couple's reaction to not getting caught up in the wasteland that is major, some major cities. Rain falls on morning rush. My lover understands that it's a battle. She presses against me on a windswept Boston corner. We, alone, amid the rush of shadows, Return the gaze of the sculpture swans perched atop a hotel near the park, their wooden wings straining as a stream of tailored suits with pinstriped arms holding bleak umbrellas aloft scan with steely eyes the rain-speckled street dreaming diamonds from shards of glass. The rain beats upon their umbrellas, cascades to the pavement, Sluices along the gutter, churning gold dust from grains of city sand, loosed from cracks anchoring dull weeds. Our, alone, our aloneness draws her closer. She folds our umbrella. The rain streams through her silken hair, forming pearls that roll across her shoulder blades, breasts. The battle, are we losing the battle, she sighs, as she turns her gaze from the swans to me. Anticipating my reply, she offers me her neck to kiss. Little swan thing there. <laughs> uh, have to see Cheryl when she gives me the hook. <clears throat> uh, this is a sort of uh, onomatopoeia in a sense. Uh, counting the storm, so if you look in the distance, you'll see a flash of lightning, and if you count one, one thousand, two, one thousand, you kind of tell the storm is getting closer, farther away. <laughs> This is based on that, so the, the poem will go along with that. Flash of light, horizon bright, nine one thousand ten. Same who and why, no lullaby. Storm begins again. I try to sleep, I fight to keep. Eight one thousand nine. Away a dream, familiar theme, slipping out of time. Windows open, curtains blowing, seven thousand eight. Spectral shapes, these shadows paint a mural as I wait. Pillow useless, soft caress, 61007. Would calm my fears, someone appears. Soft help from hell or heaven? The pains soon flow, the past is slow. 51006. Familiar faces, raindrops trace, it's now a maddening mix. They rush to meet me, spatter sweetly, 41005. In my mind's grist, they grind to mist, yet still they seem to thrive. A muted voices, unsung choices, 31004. A haunting din is born within, a sleepless nighttime roar. Veins now pulsing, room convulsing, 21003. This evening rain, while I have lain, has made a moat around me. So near the edge of my island bed, 11002. Who's lying here is never clear, I can't remember who. Ceiling gripping, bed ships gripping, 01001. Am I to die this stormy lie and never know the sun? So near the edge of my island bed, 11002, who's lying here is never clear. I can't remember who. Copy this one. Uh, this is a short one. It might not make sense, but it's, a, it's some things you inherit from your family. Sometimes you get a house and money. Sometimes you get nothing. Sometimes you get debt, uh, wisdom, sometimes not. The one thing. The one thing I inherited, you know, the one thing, 
only thing was this feeling, I don't know, but this idea that life was going to turn out, and it was, and that was it, and it did. Uh, uh, right. So that's what I inherited. Uh, I have to talk about these. Uh, when I was asked to do this about six months ago, I kept thinking, oh, don't, uh, six months. <laughs> you know, who can think that far ahead? I know when you plan these, but you have to do that. And so six months came, and I said, you know, I'm six months older, and I, you know, I like doing these, but I don't like six months in advance. And, uh, I wrote this one when I, when I, a couple of days after 911. I went down to New York City to see the mess after the towers fell. And I, all along the city, you'll see these, these down by the uh, past Soho, down in uh, the village. They had these 8 by 10 you know, pieces like this, all mimeographed with somebody's photo on it and where they were at the time and where they, what floor they were on. People still, still thought they were going to find these people. And I saw one about this woman named Jenny, and their family's you know, given her statistics. I just thought about her last few moments uh, when she went to, you know, left her where she was in bed and ended up in work, punching the clock. Out past the city lights, you watched as a thousand meteors, and then some thousands more defined the night. It's nearly 9 a.m. in the fragile blue sky, shy of arriving late as you'd lingered a minute or two beside your warm love, and as you reach for your time card, you remember, in vivid blush, the last caress and kiss and press of heat and the wisp of light to the downturn blind. As you pull your card from the slot, you see it was not a time card at all, but a ticket aboard the next meteor. Fine, okay. That wasn't easy to see that. Uh, I have two more, I think. This is a friend of mine, uh, Fred Gerard. The reaching, reaching ocean waves wash smooth my footprints, my advances. As an early morning tide flows near to this bare, this barren higher ground, where I now make my stand. My hair in tousled disarray, upon my lips the stinging spray. As a gale of the stormy wintry sea courses through my mind and soul, and bears its darkness inward to an even stormier land. While the wind and stream around my body channels past the bay, soon shall the seas of a present desires pass for want of sails, for sails are rent and rigging stripped, and all that stands is massed. A king's pine, tall and true, yet bare, his bone upon the shore is cast. It stares intently at the line which blends the earth and sea and sky, that lures the strong of heart to seek, yet reached but with the eye. So where does man's life then begin, his unbound pages in the wind, when each step brings him closer to, yet further from his naked truth? The dunes behind now casting shadow, day is on the wane. The sea has ebbed to foreign ports, and I a few steps closer fain. The wind has ceased its futile blasts. My world is in the lee of life and love, pain and death, leaving time alone in me. All these winds and tides shall never bring the horizon any nearer to me. They serve to pound my memory with those who've come and drifted through me. Heaven, I wonder if the waves that wash this trodden shore collect my footprints from the sand and deposit but a bit of me with each, with each tide on another land. Yeah. I think I'll do just one more. This is called winter a little bit. Winter. The rain beats cold on the red brick courtyard finds its way to the cracks, to the drains, to the sea. Does a human face, does a human trace find its way into the rain? Has the trace of the rain found its way into my eyes? The rain is eternal on the red brick courtyard. Red bricks blood, the essence of man. Bones ground into mortar. Yet who is raining on me as I make my way through the living courtyard? If I were to lie on these bricks, would it hasten my date with the sea? Am I already there? 
In the tavern, I order wine. A fire has been lit. It warms the air and dries my coat and my beard. The red bricks radiate. The mahogany mantle frames the blaze. I see myself in the flames. The smoke finds its way through the flue, to the rain, to the elemental sea. Is to lie down, to sleep on the embers, the answer? Is this life a mere pause? I see myself in this glass of wine. The wine is the rain, is the blood, and the brick is the sea. The smoke is the sea, the flame is the wine. If there is love in the wine, does it find its way to me? The mahogany frames the flame, the glass frames the wine. Mortar frames the brick, yet does love frame me? Is to live, to love, to drink, to die redundant? Is today so important? Thank you much for listening and have a nice day.
that's a David Alney song. David's from uh, Rhode Island. Uh, also, uh, additional words by Emmy Lou Harris and Daniel Lanois. Um, it's actually on, on the CD produced by Seth Connolly and getting a little airplay right now, and I'm very thankful for that. I'm just going to take a second, switch guitars. Um, Dave, uh, although he grew up in uh, Rhode Island, lives down in, in Nashville, and um, he's a pretty busy guy. He's uh, written with uh, other folks, good friends. Uh, I think he was a roommate with Town Van Zandt at one point. And uh, Dave and this next writer uh, are very good friends. This is a song by Tom Russell called Blue Wing. He had a blue wing tattooed on his shoulder. Might have been a bluebird, I don't know. But he gets stone drunk and talk about Alaska. Salmon boats at 45 below He said he got this blue wing up in Walla Walla And his cellmate there was little Willie John Now Willie, he was once a great blues singer Dark in here, can't see the sky. But I look at this blue wing and I close my eyes and I fly away beyond these walls up above the clouds where the rain don't fall on a poor man's dream. salmon still ran free and his father's fathers crossed that wild old Bering Sea and the land belonged to everyone there were old songs yet to sing now he's narrowed down to a cheap hotel and a tattooed prison hey it's dark in here can't see the sky
Another uh, another songwriter, close enough. Another songwriter that, whose work I really admire is the late Stan Rogers, and I I haven't been doing much of his material lately, but I uh, played this song um, last month at a uh, farm festival actually, and it just uh, uh, playing it for farmers was uh, was really kind of neat, and uh, uh, it reminds me that. Uh, you know, there's so many songs out there, even though they may have been contemporary, they, they really are like sort of like singing the blues or singing like a traditional song, even if we didn't write it. Um, they're written by people that may no longer be here, who can no longer do their music. Um, and uh, um, this is just one of my favorite songs that he wrote. It's called Field Behind the Plow. Watch the field Behind the plow, turn the straight dark roads, feel the trickle in your clothes, blow the dust cake from your nose, hear the tractor's steady roar. I can't stop now, there's a quarter section more less to go. And it figures that the rain keeps its own sweet time. You can watch it come for miles, but you guess you got a while. So ease the throttle out of hair. Every rod's a gain, and there's victory. Let's see. 
I'm going to do, was going to retune, but I will not belabor retuning in front of a live audience. That's, uh, so I'm going to make the mental shift from one tuning to another and uh, do it straight. Um, this next song is, uh, uh, is uh, on my CD, as is Deeper Well um, and uh, Blue Wing. Uh, this one was written by uh, Dave Alvin, who is a, uh, another friend of Tom Russell's, um, kind of a theme going there. Uh, he wrote this for his dad. I think any of us my age, you know, those of us baby boomers, can kind of relate to this. Most of our dads uh, fought in, in World War II. My dad actually worked at the Quincy Shipyard, too. When he was in high school, the bus picked up the boys when school was out, and they all went down to the shipyard because they were all building battleships. Um, my dad was uh, in the 82nd Airborne. He was... Uh, uh, an interrogator, uh, but a really nice guy. Picked up bassoon when he was in Germany. Bought a heckle bassoon for two cases of Hershey bars. I hate to tell you what I sold it for after he was gone, because I could never play the damn thing. I had to had to pass it on. But um, I do think of my dad. Dave wrote this for his dad. Uh, Dave rarely performs this song. Uh, he told me that uh, um, sometimes it takes his audience. Uh, four or five more songs to recover from it, because uh, those of you that know Dave Alvin, he's a bit of a rocker, a little more up-tempo, so, um, you know, I don't know if this will be my last song here either, because you may not be able to recover, but it's a great song, he doesn't do it often, and he was kind enough to uh, let me do this royalty-free, and um, God bless him, Dave, wherever you are tonight, um, I thank you. It's called Man in the Bed. the man 
man I've always been So don't believe what the doctors say They're just making things up So they can get paid Yeah, it ain't me they're talking about anyway the man in the bed isn't me I slipped out the door and I'm finally free yeah young and wild like I'll always be oh, the man in the bed isn't me doing Cheryl how am I doing on time here I'm done quick song quick song um, okay thank you all for coming thank you all for coming um, sorry uh, uh, not all of me not only am I getting older, I'm also deaf as a post, even with these hearing aids in. So uh, being entertained by a deaf folk singer, that, that's kind of a frightening thing. <laughs> Actually, it may be a little more normal than that. Um, ooh, quick song. Uh, I'm free. Let's see. Um, okay. We're going to do a real quick version of Poncho and Lefty. <laughs> Living on the road, my friend, was gonna keep you free and clean. Now you wear your skin like iron, your press is hard as kerosene. Weren't your mama's only boy, but her favorite one, it seems. She began to cry when you said goodbye. Yeah. So I'm going to begin uh, with a poem by Rilke, translated by Mary Kinsey. Uh, it's called Day in Autumn. 
And, uh, and I really try to arrange my trips back to New England so that I come back in October. It's a great place, great time to be here. And it's a joy and a pleasure to be here today. I, I came once and read in the open mic and I said, I want to feature there sometime. Day in autumn. After the summer's yield, Lord, it is time to let your shadow lengthen on the sundials and in the pastures let the rough winds fly. As for the final fruits, coax them to roundness. Direct on them two days of warmer light to hail them golden toward their term and harry the last few drops of sweetness through the wine. Whoever's homeless now will build no shelter. Who lives alone will live indefinitely so. Waking up to read a little, draft long letters, and along the city's avenues, fitfully wander when the wild leaves loosen. Rainer Maria Rilke. I'm going to begin uh, with a with a poem that, that uh, I, like, I, I like to begin with, any, anywhere where there's an open mic. Um, I am a creature of the open mics. If I had never discovered the open mics, 80% of my stuff would never have been written. Uh, so I, I, have, I, have a, I have a huge debt to the people who undertake the work of, of running these things. Um, this poem is called Song of the Open Mics, and a couple of things you need to know. Seth is my wife's son by her first marriage. A ney is a traditional Persian flute. And the Music City Cafe is a place in St. Paul, Minnesota, where they used to have an open mic on Monday nights. Song of the Open Mics. When Seth played his ney in the open mic, at the Music City Cafe. We recalled his telling us the long, slow process it had been to win the instrument's consent to utter any sound at all, because it seemed at first as though this would be a throwback to that earlier time. He tried and tried to blow, but no sound came, and so he called for water, sipped a moment while the audience shifted and whispered like fallen leaves then picked it up again and strained down into it, looking a little desperate, till finally the long flute sounded, and the audience went silent from embarrassment to respect at the long, slow notes like whales, like nothing I had ever heard except the songs of whales. And no one knows why whales sing so, only that their songs are long and slow, and they never repeat the chorus exactly the same way twice. Whales have large brains, much larger than they would seem to need for lives that, with all due respect, must be described as simple. Swim, swallow plankton, surface every so often to breathe and blow, once in a great while, mate, when you feel sand pushing you up out of the water. Back off! <laughs> Have I left out anything? It's a principle of evolution that things unnecessary for survival fall away. So what's the point of all that brain? Well, there's another principle that says when you've got two unanswered questions, try letting one answer the other. And some scientists have suggested that perhaps the big brain and the long song are connected. I like that idea. There are chambers in my brain that went unopened until poetry. I can survive from nine to five without using everything between my ears. Hey, some of my ideas endanger me. A while back, my co-workers were going out to celebrate, meeting in October, our target profit for the year, and I wanted to shake them and say, listen, this is a celebration of the combination of how much we do and how little they pay. Why don't we work for half as much? Then we could celebrate in May. But I back off till I get here, where such ideas won't get me fired. If whales were people, they'd be here too, listening to our long, slow, necessary songs, being politically correct, applauding ideas of mutual respect, like, well, like, save the whales. This, the song I heard in the open mic at the Music City Cafe 
when Seth played his nay. Seth, never known to play anything the same way twice. I decided to do this poem when, you know, there's been so much talk about Quincy here today. And I have a friend here uh, to whom I know this poem means a lot. Uh, it's a poem about a Boston traffic landmark and a guy that my father knew in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's called Neponset Circle, and it's from my wife, Carol, the woman who drives me to poetry. The Quincy AA group liked to let Charlie drive on their commitments. He was a careful driver who stayed a mile or two under the speed limit, and he liked to leave a little earlier than other people would. But he never missed a turn or had to ask for directions, and he always got the group to the meeting on time. Sometimes a newcomer would ask why they had gone from Quincy to Brockton by way of Neponset Circle. There are back roads into Brockton, shortcuts, an old-timer would whisper, shh, we know there are quicker ways, but Charlie likes to drive, and he can get us anywhere in the world as long as he starts from the Ponset Circle. <laughs> Most of us see the world as spiderweb, all sorts of intricate connections, alternate routes, a good sense of direction in a roadmap, and we'll always find our way. Charlie saw it as a bicycle tire spokes crossing each other here and there, but all of them running straight to and from one heart. Over the years, a lot of people got too impatient to put up with Charlie's ways. He wouldn't even take the Squanum Street cutoff, they'd complain. You could almost see Neponset Circle from both ends. Sometimes they'd maneuver themselves into the front seat to make suggestions. Charlie, this right goes straight to Hancock Street. Yep, I know, he'd reply and cruise right by while the old-timers puffed serenely in the back. Insane, the dissidents called Charlie, or anal if they'd had Psych 101. Compulsive, as though we all weren't. But he drove them crazy. Eventually, they'd take their own cars, thank you, trust their own internal compasses. And for a while, they would look good. They'd leave a little later and be sipping coffee smugly when Charlie's cadre of newcomers and old-timers sauntered in. But sooner or later, they'd miss a turn and get lost, and a commitment would go by the boards unmet. And if it was a prison or a hospital, there would be no meeting there at all that night. And that was serious. The old-timers knew that it would happen because all the alternate routers had to go on was their own sense of direction. Charlie had in a Ponset Circle. Carol, my love, you're mine, Neponset Circle. And this one is called An Evening of Cowboy Poetry in Groton, Massachusetts, sponsored by the Nashua River Watershed Association. The newspaper said it would be a gas for them that could make the scene. Real cowboy poets in Groton, Mass, right on Route 119. So when Carol got money in the mail, we decided to go. Got out a map and hit the trail, anticipating the show. On a dark stretch of road just north of town, I caught a glimpse of a sign. Started to speak, then quieted down as the road continued to wind. Carol was driving and heard that sound I almost didn't make, said, tell me, darling, should we turn around for some road I was supposed to take? I said, I didn't mean to make no fuss, but there was this sign on a tree. But then I decided it wasn't for us. It said cowboy pottery. She asked me if maybe I might have misread, because I don't see that good at night. But I was pretty sure I said that I had read it right. So she asked, just a little uptight, did I think it had come to pass? Two cowboy events on a Saturday night on a road out of Groton, Mass? I allowed us how it just might be worth turning around to check. And when we got back, it said poetry. Sure is all nearsighted heck. 
So we give them money and they give us change and we had a rare old time. Laughing and crying and home on the range. Them buckaroos sure could rhyme. Though this feller next to us in Tweed, he could have enjoyed it more. He kept muttering something about the need for a cowboy editor. <laughs> but no complaints from Carol and me of our evening so iambic. Except maybe it would have been nice to see a little cowboy ceramic. <laughs> Thinking of nights they hang out by the fire, singing and story and whatnot. Some wrangler just might get a burning desire to kneel down and throw a pot. He'd get his clay from under the sand by the bank of the old water hole and pat it and knead it and shape it by hand while the stories were being told. And just before turning in for the night, he'd set it right next to the blaze. And in the morning, his pot would be bright with a beautiful, lucent glaze. And though our cowboy will pass his days without much hugging and kissing, no one will ever be able to say, he don't have a pot to piss in. <laughs> I tell it the way it could have gone down the night of the cowboy shows on Route 119 in Groton Town, where the Nashua River flows. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people ask me, you know, that, why doesn't that poem end one stanza earlier with the, the pot line? <laughs> but anybody who's familiar with, with cowboy poetry knows that fully 80% of their, their poems end with where such and such a river flows. So, you know, that the last stanza had to be there to be, to be true to the tradition. And uh, now this is a poem that my wife hates. Um... After interviewing hundreds of men, Miss Manners answers all your questions about men's room etiquette. <laughs> the first great commandment is, you never make the slightest move, however innocent, they could interpret as expressing interest in another man's, how shall I say this, Remember, choosing your urinal is half the game. If there's only one urinal, there's no choice and therefore no exposure, except be quick if they're lined up behind. If there are two urinals, then each is as good as the other. But you must turn your shoulder very slightly from the fixture not taken. The slightness of the gesture is important. This is not fear, but nuance, delicacy. Even if no one's there when you arrive, calibrate the attitude of shoulder so you don't have to move a millimeter should someone come to take the other one. If there are three urinals, then things get more complicated. A good rule is you never stand beside another man if there's a choice. Rule two, if you have an option, never make the next man in stand next to you. With three, therefore, the only time you go the middle is when the other two are taken. And if you have no choice but a position between two other men, hunch your shoulders up and go in deep, gaze straight ahead, and think of waterfalls. If there are four or five and fairly busy, an Eastwood movie, say, or a Bruins game, go for the end position if it's there. Beside is always better than between. But if there are more than five or six and mostly empty, don't go to the end. It makes you look like a wimp. And although this is always an ordeal, you must not let it show. One position left or right of middle is ideal. Idiosyncrasies in general are to be avoided. Like this new phenomenon of men for whom the fly is not enough, but they must undo their pants entirely to get their business done. The men I talk to ask, are they trying to tell us something? Like, they just don't make these flies big enough anymore, do they, buddy? <laughs> well, I guess you don't have that problem. Or are they wearing women's underpants? <laughs> what about that little sag men do with their knees as they unzip the fly as though preparing to lift something really heavy? <laughs> My men consider this within the bounds of etiquette, unconscious hyperbole that injures no one. And if there's a soggy cigarette butt in your line of fire, targeting it does not count as an idiosyncrasy to be avoided. Indeed, some men describe it as a gender imperative. Women get to make babies, 
Men play Battleship with Marlboros. It's okay. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. <laughs> the last thing always is to wash your hands. If they don't have paper towels, wipe them on your pants. Real men don't use blow dryers. <laughs> I was just old enough to be out on the sidewalk by myself, and every day I would come home crying, beaten up by the same little girl. I was Jackie, the firstborn, the apple of every eye. Gratuitous meanness bewildered me, and as soon as she'd hit me, I'd bawl like a baby. I knew that boys were not supposed to cry, but they weren't supposed to hit girls either, and I was shocked when my father said, hit her back. I thought it was a great idea. But the only thing I remember about that girl today is the look that came over her face after I did hit her back. She didn't cry. Instead, her eyes got narrow, and I thought, Jackie, you just made a terrible mistake. And she really beat the crap out of me. It was years before I trusted my father's advice again. <laughs> I eventually learned to fight, enough to protect myself from girls. But the real issue was the crying, and that hasn't gone away. Oh, I don't cry anymore, I don't sob, I don't make noise, I just have hair-triggered tear ducts and always at all the wrong things. Supermarket openings, the mayor cutting the ribbon on the bridge. In movies, I despise the easy manipulation that never even bothers to engage my feelings. It just comes straight from my eyes, but there's not a damn thing I can do about it, and I hate myself for it. The surreptitious nose blow, a discreet four minutes after the offending scene, my daughters are on to me, my wife. They all know exactly when to give me that quick, sidelong glance. What must they think of me? In real life, I don't cry anymore when things hurt. Never a tear at 17 when my mother died, my father. I never cried for my first marriage. But today, I often cry when things turn out well. An unexpected act of simple human decency. New evidence against all odds of how much someone loves me. I think all this is why I never wanted a son. I always supposed my son would be like me and that when he'd cry, it would bring back every indelible humiliation of my own life. And in some word or gesture, I'd betray what I was feeling. And he'd mistake and think I was ashamed of him. He'd carry that the rest of his life. Daughters. Daughters are easy. You can pick them up, you can hug them, you say, there, there, it's all right. Everything is going to be all right. And for that moment, you really believe that you can make enough of it right. Enough. The unskilled labor of love. And if you cry a little with them for all the inevitable gratuitous meannesses of life, that crying is not to be ashamed of. But for years, my great fear was the moment I might have to deal with a crying son. But I don't have one. We came close once between Megan and Kathleen. The doctors told us there was something wrong. And when Joan went into labor, they said the baby would be born dead. But he wasn't. Very briefly, before he died, I heard him cry. Probably every poet in the room has at least one poet somewhere, one poem somewhere, that when you started writing it, you had absolutely no idea where it was going to take you. And that was my experience with that particular poem. And every time I perform it, I, I feel as though I'm sharing with the audience the, the emotional ride I went on uh, in, in the course of writing that poem. Uh, this next poem, uh, as I mentioned earlier, my father was in Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and he used to talk to me sometimes about it. He was, he was haunted 
by the thought of all of the alcoholics who had lived and died before there was any kind of a program to come to, before there was any kind of healing available and, and the hopelessness of their condition. And, and he passed that on to me so forcefully that I was kind of haunted by it myself. And when I got serious about writing poetry, I thought maybe, maybe this is, maybe I can talk about it in a poem. This poem is called Drunks, and it's for all those alcoholics who lived and died before there was a program. We died of pneumonia in furnished rooms where they found us three days later when somebody complained about the smell. We died against bridge abutments and nobody knew if it was suicide. And we probably didn't know ourselves, except in the sense that it was always suicide. We died in hospitals, our stomachs huge, distended, and there was nothing they could do. We died in cells, never knowing whether we were guilty or not. We went to priests, they gave us pledges, they told us to pray, they told us to go and sin no more, but go. We tried and we died. We died of overdoses. We died in bed, but usually not the big bed. We died in straitjackets, in the DTs, seeing God knows what, creeping, skittering, slithering, shuffling things. And you know what the worst thing was? The worst thing was that nobody ever believed how hard we tried. We went to doctors and they gave us stuff to take that would make us sick when we drank on the principle of so crazy it just might work, I guess. Or they sent us places like Dropkick Murphy's and when we came out we were hooked on peraldehyde. Or maybe we lied to the doctors and they told us, don't drink so much, just drink like me. And we tried. And we died. We drowned in our own vomit or choked on it, our broken jaws wired shut. We died playing Russian roulette and everybody thought we'd lost. We died under the hoofs of horses, under the wheels of vehicles, under the knives and boot heels of our brother drunks. We died in shame. And you know what was even worse? It was that we couldn't believe it ourselves that we had tried and we died believing that we didn't know what it meant to try when we were desperate or hopeful or deluded or embattled enough to go for help, we went to people with letters after their names and prayed that they might have read the right books that had the right words in them, never suspecting the terrifying truth that the right words, as simple as they were, had not been written yet. We died falling off girders on high buildings because of course iron workers drink, of course they do. We died with a shotgun in our mouth or jumping off a bridge and everybody knew it was suicide. We died under the Southeast Expressway with our hands tied behind us and a bullet in the back of our head because this time the people that we disappointed were the wrong people. We died in convulsions or of insult to the brain, incontinent and in disgrace, abandoned. If we were women, we died degraded because women have so much more to live up to. We tried, and we died, and nobody cried. And the very worst thing was that for every one of us who died, there were another hundred of us or another thousand who wished that we would die, who went to sleep praying we would not have to wake up because what we were enduring was intolerable. And we knew in our hearts it was never going to change. One day in a hospital room in New York City, one of us had what the books call a transforming spiritual experience. And he said to himself, I've got it. No, you haven't. You've only got part of it. And I have to share it. Now you've almost got it. And he tried to give it away, but we couldn't hear it. The transmission line wasn't open yet. We tried to hear it. We tried and we died. We died of one last cigarette, the comfort of its glowing in the dark. We passed out and the bed caught fire. They said we suffocated before our body burned. They said we never felt a thing. That was the best way, maybe, that we died. Except sometimes we took our family with us. And the man in New York was so sure he had it. He tried to love us into sobriety, but that didn't work either. Love confuses drunks. Still he tried, and still we died. One after another, we got his hopes up, and we broke his heart, because that's what we do. And the very worst thing of all the worst things was that every time we thought we knew what the worst thing was, something happened that was even worse.
until a day came in a hotel lobby, and it wasn't in Rome or Jerusalem or Mecca or even Dublin or South Boston. It was in Akron, Ohio, for Christ's sake. A day came when the man said, I have to find a drunk because I need him as much as he needs me. Now you've got it. And the transmission line, after all those years, was open. The transmission line was open. And now we don't go to priests and doctors and people with letters after their names. We come to people who have been there. We come to each other. And we try. And we don't have to die. I'm going to finish with this one. Uh, a few summers ago, my daughter Kathleen got married. She asked me to write a poem for the wedding. This is the poem. It's called Epithalamion, A Few Words for Kathleen. We're here today to celebrate the wedding of Kathleen and Mark. Kathleen, when she was eight years old, started coming with me to AA meetings on Friday nights. That group had really good coffee. And as she would make her way time after time to the coffee pot, I would lose sight of Kathleen because she was short. But I could follow her progress by watching the heads turn to bless her with their eyes as she passed, beautiful child that she was. At the break, they would raffle off a big book. And when the meeting broke up, Kathleen would go from table to table, collecting all the discarded raffle tickets, which she would bring home and store in a shoebox. Why? I never figured it out. Up came my anniversary, and my sponsor was out of town. So I asked Kathleen if she'd be willing to say a few words in front of a room full of grown-ups, and she was game. Kathleen was always game. She had to stand on a chair to reach the microphone, and if I remember right, what she said was, it is always an occasion when someone celebrates their 11th anniversary. Jack? And if I had been expecting something a little more, what, personal? Still, it was a great beginning for a 10-year run. The next year, she didn't need to stand on the chair, and she wrote a poem that began, My dad is the best. He's been that way since birth. It's a shame there's only one of him on the planet Earth. <laughs> Kathleen's presence those Friday nights lit up that big gymnasium. And a lot of people who never got to watch their own kids grow up came to look forward to her presentations as a highlight of their year. Tom G., who couldn't come with us when we put on meetings in prisons because he always set off the metal detectors, because he had a police bullet lodged inoperably close to his spine, said to me, that kid is the best advertisement for this program that anyone could ever see. And Billy T., a former 300-pound biker, told me he had a daughter Kathleen's age somewhere. And every year he would cry at her presentation. But it was the good crying. Now it's my turn to say a few words for Kathleen. But she's tied my hands a little, made me promise not to make her cry. So I'll address my comments to the groom. Probably most fathers of the bride, if they were honest, would admit that they don't think there's a young man in the world who's worthy of their little girl. I want Mark to know that I don't feel that way particularly. <laughs> Still, what I'm sure of is that Kathleen and Mark have been extraordinarily lucky to find each other. It's crazy out there. Most of us feel fortunate to find anyone willing to cast their lot with us, let alone the right person. Today, my heart is telling me that this is right. Now, Mark, about the dowry. <laughs> I'm afraid I have to ask to be dispensed from that particular archaic tradition. It's not that I'm ungenerous, just unemployed. <laughs> but somewhere among Kathleen's belongings, in a cellar or an attic or at the bottom of a closet, you might still find a shoebox full of raffle tickets that didn't win anything. If you find it, Mark, hang on to it. A lot of hopes went into that box, the hopes of people whose last names I never knew. 
people who didn't win life's lotteries, didn't dodge all of life's bullets, who once looked at Kathleen and took heart, who loved her and left their tickets on the tables in hope that they might be for her tickets to a better life than they had had. And any time you feel that life's too hard and you're too much alone, take that box out, run your fingers through those old raffle tickets, mix them up real good, and think about how much luck it takes to find the one person in the world that we were meant to find. Then go to the kitchen and put on a pot of some really good coffee and make enough for two people. Thank you. This past January, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. However, my doctor said that the success rate for the radiation uh, therapy treatment would be about 96 to 98 percent because my uh, cancer was in the beginning stages and also because it was confined to just one area of the prostate. So in April and May, I had 41 sessions of radiation therapy. And then last month in September, I was tested again for cancer. And uh, the test results showed that the cancer was in complete remission. And uh, I feel great, as a matter of fact. So I wrote a poem, uh, which I'm going to read today. But this poem uh, that I wrote was uh, written the day after I learned that I had cancer, and this was last January. It's entitled, Thoughts on Hitting Medicine's Trifecta. I have a serious heart condition with a defibrillator in my chest, which constantly adjusts my arrhythmia so I don't go permanently to rest. I'm also a diabetic who takes insulin three times a day. I go to my health club daily to keep these diseases at bay. This week I learned I have cancer and am making medical history because I'm still a busy writer who reads poetry on TV. <laughs> now I have medicine's big three, but I don't know the name of number four. Yet, since I'm such a friendly host, number four should soon be at my door. So, Rather than radiate my cancer, I think a body transplant would suit me. I could request the body of Brad Pitt and spend my time dallying with Miss Jolie. I wanted to read a poem not by me, but by my friend Bill Holzhauser, wonderful Cambridge poet who died about five years ago. Um, I want to read this because of Bill, because this is a poem about uh, working with wood. It's called The Pie Safe. It was a new state, Arkansas, when the pie safe was built there. And it was the West, bordered by the Indian nation and a part of Mexico called Texas. Secession and war were well in the future. He was a settler, settled enough at least that a heavy piece of furniture, awkward to move, was not a burden but a possession worth working to build over the winter after harvest. To lever up his domestic economy and scotch it to try to hold a bride and a cabin in place on these plains where all eyes looked eastward, westward. But the spring rain sucked it all east, back toward the river. He had oak for the body and legs, thick cut and planed smooth, but the doors were red pine, rough cut so the round burns from a backwood saw blade were branded in the surface. And the inner shelves were cypress, dried to an olive corrugation. 
a bastard conglomerate of woods at hand. The iron nails were hand-forged, square-headed, widely spaced. He used nails, too, to peck constellations of hull patterns in the tin, covered the round openings in each door to keep out flies. To keep out ants, each leg absurdly small, tapered to fit in a jar lid his wife could fill with molasses. As he worked, he noted how his world assumed the shape of the pie safe. The day's square-shouldered, light-footed, each night a trunk of cypress-shelved darkness, less vast than at other times. He thought, my work, not my life, my work, not my name, will outlive me, will stand solid, useful, in unguessable days and places, and free its feet in another man's molasses after I'm gone. And the thought pleased him. I wrote a book on performing, as some of you may know. And uh, wherever I go, I will be sitting in the audience. And somebody will invariably say from the podium, Steve Rapson says that I should do this, that, and the other thing. <laughs> it's driving me nuts. Here's a song from my alcohol trilogy, which uh, Jack has prompted me that I know and I should do every time. I think that uh, I'm not getting what I want in life. It's called A Little Bit of Crow. I have the recipe for those of you who uh, would like it after my song. Once I ate a little bit of crow, a little bit of crow, and a little wine old. Once I ate a little bit of crow, it all went down with a little wine oh. Once I ate a little bit of crow. Once I ate some words I said, words I said all in my bread. Once I ate some words I said, they all went down with Johnny Walker Red. All went down with Johnny Walker Red. A little bit of crow, a little wine oh, words in the bread, and a little bit of red. A little bit of crow, a little wine oh, words in the bread, a little bit of red. Once I drank from the river of fire, I sank real low, not getting any higher. Once I was drinking from the river of fire, and I was sinking real low, not getting any higher. Singing real low, not getting no higher. It's a little bit of crow, a little wino, down to the river in the fire I go. A little bit of crow, a little wino, down to the river in the fire I go. Whoa, whoa. Each time I have one last glass, I must ask before I go. Whoa, whoa. May I please have a doggy bag to take home my little bit of crow? Once I ate a little bit of crow. Well, you want to get to heaven, I'll tell you what to do. Don't you cook up what's bad for you. Might have been a lot of things that you wish you didn't do, but you learn how to cook and there's a heaven for you. Yeah, learn how to cook, you can get to heaven too. A little bit of crow, a little wino, down through the river and the fire we go. A little bit of crow, a little wino, down to the river and the fire we go. Once I ate a little bit of crow. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't think I will have my fill of a little bit of crow. And the poem I have to share this morning is, um, it's kind of a poem for the ladies. 
The doctors, they call it perimenopause. Sleepless nights, short temper, explosive diatribes, passionate beliefs, and the dreaded hot flash. But I now know that I am an autumn tree, burning red before I lose all my leaves and bear my branches for the coming winter. I know the splendid alchemy accompanying my passage and the brilliant hue of scarlet that changes my nurturing green leaves into something much, much more. A chemical passion sweeps through my body, altering every cell, and I was totally unprepared for the ultimate beauty of it all. As I walk through the autumn foliage, I laugh with glee at the changing scenery where pastoral backgrounds become fiery infernos of yellow, orange, and red. Leaves burn with fury and excitement before finally letting go and dropping to the ground. Winds howl, swirling leaves for a whirlwind ride, and the rain, yes, the rain will cry and cry and cry and wash those leaves down too. And finally, after a most glorious season, the trees are bare, and with branches outstretched to reach to the heavens above, they are finally able to take in all the cosmic splendor of the starry skies to come. Well, the sun burned hot, it burned my eyes, burned so hot. Thought I died, thought I died and gone to hell, looking for the water from a deeper well. So I went to the river, but the river was dry. Fell to my knees and I looked to the sky, looked to the sky and the spring rain fell. I drank the water from a deeper well. Looking for the 